I like the Earth. In fact, I might even like like it, so you know it's serious. I have spent my entire life on Earth. I've never once been outside of its atmosphere. Unless you're one of a very handful of people, you and I have this in common. Earth is considered to be very small, however size is relative. Compared to Jupiter, yes, Earth is very small. Compared to me, an individual woman with only two forward-facing eyes, it is very large. I wish I could see it all, but I cannot and will not. To even try is prohibitively expensive, and every border imposed by the nation-states of humanity represents a challenging hurdle. Even if these obstacles were overcome, time is the ultimate and undefeatable adversary. Plus, it's probably physically exhausting, too. All those mountains sure are pretty to look at, but climbing them is a whole other story. Defeated by human invention, universal laws, and the threat of exhaustion, I must content myself with other means of observing the globe. The chief tool I use toward to those ends is Google Earth. Google is a massive corporation that does all the things corporations do. They are monopolistic, exploitative, corruptive, invasive, and generally poo-poo. That their workers developed some handy tools does not excuse their sins. A common boomer response to communism is that if you like communism so much, then stop using your damned iPhones, video games, and computers. Ignorant they are that these products are the fruit of workers, and that the workers should own the full value of their labor. The problem is not the product, the problem is the mode of production and who benefits from it. There are numerous new technologies that would be of considerable benefit to all humanity, but their full potential is twisted or altogether squandered due to capitalism's profit motive. Many mundane, many crucial to the survival and prosperity of humanity and the world. A mundane example is that movies and shows can be streamed and enjoyed almost anywhere. It's a shame they're all divided amongst several different streaming services. A more crucial example is that a mechanized labor force would liberate billions from needing to work at all, but under capitalism, a mechanized workforce is a threat that drives lower wages and increases poverty due to unemployment and diminished bargaining power. The internet is an amazing feat that connects the world and shares the collective information of all human history and progress. Yet, it's mostly used to gather data so that corporations can form a psych profile on us and algorithmically determine which advertisements we'd most likely be manipulated by. And a lot of the information is locked behind paywalls anyway, particularly academic information. So if you're poor, it's only useful for social media, trading information and study for misinformation and hearsay. Democracy dies in darkness, indeed. I think it's really just neato how I can have a world-spanning map that gives me active directions and suggestions on how to reach my destination. It's a damn shame it can also be used to track my movements. And this brings us to Google Earth. Using satellite images, they've pieced together a mosaic of the entire Earth's surface. It might be fun to see your home's rooftop from space, or revisit your hometown and go down Nostalgia Lane. Or, just the same, it's fun to see all those landmarks and monuments you've seen in the movies. More than that, with Street View, you can get more than just rooftops and see what things look like up close on ground level. Handy as it may be, we should remember that the technology enabling this was the result of Cold War era needs for espionage. Check out this North Korean military base. Pretty neat, huh? If I were an American general plotting an invasion, I'd probably send some missiles this way. Or say I'm in the CIA or FBI. Satellite surveillance would be pretty handy. Cameras are only getting better and better, and where once there was a blurry image of, I don't know, some trees maybe, we can now clearly see people. Hand in hand with cell phone GPS locations, it's only ever gotten easier. Of course, this can work both ways. Here's Guantanamo Bay, for instance, complete with airstrip, detention center, and a McDonald's. You know, for the troops. Despite all that nasty business, these tools still remain very useful to the average person. In a post-revolutionary world, Google Maps, Earth, and similar maps would be free of their contemptible baggage and be what they should have always been. Useful tools benefiting humanity. I myself use Google Street View extensively. Whenever I'm going to a new place, it's nice to be able to get a feel for it beforehand. 
Before moving to Korea, I often spent time virtually wandering the streets of Seoul, learning the road layouts, observing traffic congestion, seeing what parks looked nice, and generally absorbing as much as I could to give me a head start on acclimating to the new environment. And of course, it is cool to see the many sights of this world that I know I'll never get to see in person. Check out this fiery pit in Turkmenistan, or this barren valley in Antarctica, or the ruins of Pompeii, or the Chernobyl exclusion zone, or... I don't know, Big Ben, if you're into that sort of thing. Although I do find that when I do actually get to visit a landmark of some renown, I find myself wholly disappointed more often than not. This is most true with important buildings. Some buildings dominate the imagination, suggesting something larger than life. Buildings like the White House, the Empire State Building, or for me personally, the Rockefeller Center. While I've never been to DC myself, my wife Deanne assures me it's pretty lame. As for the Empire State Building, the two of us had lunch somewhere nearby and noticed it down the street and couldn't believe how small and unremarkable it looked in person. We had to double check that it was indeed the Empire State Building. One of my favorite sitcoms is 30 Rock, although every time I go back and rewatch it, I end up liking it a little less. Tangential. Anyway, the Rockefeller Center and Plaza are the typical establishing shot of the show, with the intro making extensive use of it. It looks big, impressive, important. Since seeing the show, I always wanted to see it in winter for its big tree and ice rink. Now, having the chance, I've personally seen that it fails to live up to the scale it had in my mind. In fact, it's quite cramped. Camera lenses and screens can do wonders to an image and trick us into thinking something is grander than it is. What is often captured in films and television can hardly even be described as a reflection of reality, but rather a distorted image designed to show you what the artist wanted you to see. And when you throw editing and effects into the mix, things get wild. Pictures of dense skylines hide the realities of the streets. From one image, you can get a sense of wealth, power, and prosperity. From another image, you can get a sense of poverty, powerlessness, and despair. Neither are necessarily lying, but neither are they full truths either. Together, they form an image of incredible disparity. And even this combined image doesn't tell the full story by itself. How many pictures, then, would it take to get the full truth? How many pictures would it take to gain a solid understanding of the world and the global capitalist order that subjugated it? Maybe a whole world of pictures, perhaps. What do you know of Namibia? I can say for myself, I don't know anything. What do you think life is like in Namibia? Well, here's a Shell gas station. Here's a grocery store aisle. Here is what appears to be some sort of strip mall with some really shiny cars parked out front. I now understand that Namibia has nice looking cars, gas to put in those nice looking cars, and food. But hey, that's just a few pictures from the city of Katima Mulilo. What are things like in the capital city of Winhoek? Here's a church. Here's a different church. Here's a statue of some dude, uh, Kurt Von Francois. I wonder what he did to deserve such recognition. Anyway, here's another church. Up north, there appears to be an industrial area. Here's a picture of inside a factory. Are they making vault suits? Hope these workers are getting paid well. Anyway, here's a bunch of shacks nearby. Why are there rocks on top? Is it to weigh down the roof so they don't get blown away by the wind? Namibia gives us much to think about. There seems to be great access to food and goods. There also seems to be a decently sized industrial workforce. All that seems to me like it would be a sign of economic strength, but this neighborhood that's constructed almost entirely of metal shacks suggests that the economic strength isn't shared by all. In conclusion, Namibia is a land of contrasts. Now let's consider Mombasa, Kenya. It's the setting of some key moments in the Halo games. I wonder what it looks like in real life. This road seems pretty rough. So do the houses. There are a lot of structures that are completely ruined. Let's try a different street. Maybe that's just a particular rough patch. And no, this one looks much the same. Let's try another one. Wow. It appeared this whole section of the city is like this. Let's try further into the city. We can observe this massive industrial area. Plenty of manufacturing. The shipyards alone must see billions of dollars worth of goods pass through. Why then, with this economic powerhouse, does the neighborhood next to it also look run down. Where is all the money going? You can see over on this side of the city there appears to be a distinctly greener area. 
Let's check that out. It appears to be a neighborhood of nice-looking homes that are all walled off and gated. Fascinating. In conclusion, Mombasa is a land of contrasts. But really, we should stop putting a microscope on Africa and see how things are elsewhere. America, the richest country on Earth. A very pretty Main Street, tourists love it, nice homes, got some industry here, there's also a trailer park, and here's a homeless encampment. Is America a land of contrasts? Britain? France? Germany? Is the world a land of contrasts? A world of disparity where some have much and many have little? Do we understand capitalism better? Not really. We know poor and rich people exist, and we've been able to demonstrate that the presence of industrial jobs does not equal an elevation in living standards. Maybe from that you can infer that folks should be getting paid more and rich folks elsewhere should be paid less. It's hard to know what would be obvious in a vacuum of knowledge. I guess pictures alone really don't help without bringing knowledge to them to explain them. Like, maybe you notice that even the conditions of America's poor seem better than that of Namibia's poor. But that alone doesn't tell you why. It doesn't by itself suggest imperialism, the economic relationships of the global north to the global south, and while you can see statues of colonial powers, you'll still need more knowledge to understand how the history of colonization led to this global economic disparity. Otherwise, you may just the same look at these pictures and say, oh, it's just the local corruption, the government is bad, grrr. There is the saying that a picture is worth a thousand words. But I'd add that it is your responsibility to bring those words to the picture. And with everyone having different words and insights, I believe you shouldn't take for granted what seems obvious to you, because to others it is very much not so. Even with the entire world at your fingertips, understanding the world takes more than just a casual observation. Google Earth is a nice tool for seeing the world, but it is not a good tool for understanding it. Most of the pictures you see are biased. They are not taken by locals to show what life is like where they live. They are usually taken by outsiders, by tourists or missionaries or some other third thing. They take pictures of their accomplishments or the pretty sights so they can share with their friends and family back home the cool trip they went on. Do you trust Pieter Rajmans from Austria to show you what Namibia is like? Do you trust me for that matter to show you an arrangement of pictures of a place I've never even been? I mean, Rajman's at least was actually there. That's more credibility than me. Or maybe you trust me because my voice is soothing and you know me a bit more, whereas you don't know Rajman's at all. Familiarity can be a factor of assumed trustworthiness. We could put an end to this whole line of thinking and just ask an actual Namibian, though I don't know any, do you? And even if we did ask a Namibian, there are other factors to consider. Are they some sort of nationalist with an interest in skipping over the bad bits? Are they set against the order there and would skip over the good? Whoever we ask would be just one perspective out of a population of over 2 million. How many Namibians do we have to talk to to get an understanding of Namibia? All of them? How many people do we have to talk to to get a full understanding of the world? All 7 billion of them? All information is curated. One person can never gain a full understanding. Even with all these sophisticated means of communication, even with all the stores of knowledge, we will only ever be able to see the world from our individual perspectives. Just one of billions. We will only ever be able to understand the information we do come across through that one perspective. At most, we will be able to recognize some patterns and gain a decent impression, but even that impression will be seen filtered through a lived life. We can point to some few people as authorities of knowledge, but even then, how much we recognize that authority is a matter of trust that varies from person to person. And the thoughts of that authority are just as influenced by their life as you are of yours. If you trust me, remember that I can only show you what I see. I can't always trust myself, and to be honest, I find it hard to trust anyone who seems to have little doubt. I guess my final thought is that having a bird's eye view of the earth has given me an impression of the incompleteness of every individual. That individuality is a significant limitation in understanding the world around us. We will only ever know incomplete truths. 
frustratingly, the full truth is out there, it's just that no individual will ever know it. Anyway, check out this little flight sim they built into the thing. Now that's rad. Welcome to Earth. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Keep in mind that I never intended this video to be anything more than just some pseudo-philosophical rambling. I know I can't really tell people how to react, but I'd hope you respond to what I've said as if I were a friend you're sitting on a back porch with and just kind of chilling, talking about whatever. Maybe we're high. I don't know. I've never really been high before. You might also respond by liking, commenting, subscribing, notification belling, sharing, and patron becoming. If you did become a patron, you'd get access to bonus content. Ooh. Hear more of this sweet voice while I tour the world virtually for a couple hours. Are you enticed? Of course you are. Please consider watching these videos by other creators. If you, like me, love the Earth, then maybe its destruction by humanity concerns you. Try Tash Reynolds, can planting more trees really save the planet? And they'll tell you about how there aren't any simple, quick fix solutions to the climate crisis. And also how plants work. If you are interested in how capitalism makes things worse for everyone, you might want to watch Leslie EXP's Disability and Capitalism. Maybe you'll be instilled with an understanding that placing value solely in people's ability to do work may be an issue. Also, maybe you were interested in my offhand comment about the decline of bargaining power. Get tangential and watch Queer POTUS's NAFTA and the Decline of Union Power, an excellent documentary that shows how the ruling class conspires to undermine you. I'd also like to give a shout out to my patrons, Ericobia, Dottie Wyatt, Jake, Josh Thomas, Candle Carry, Kaylee Christine, and Paz. Thank you very much for your support. Please have a wonderful day.